Hey, uh, Zaki Manian, been working in the blockchain space for nearly a decade, uh, worked on a lot of different projects. Uh, I'm most famous for helping launch the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, I co-founded with my uh, co-founder on of both Occlusion, which is like the infrastructure business, and uh, Sommelier uh, with Christy Bolston. Uh, and we did all, we've done all of this work, uh, sommelier you could think of is relevant to this question because it's kind of the 2021 version of what chain abstraction was, um, uh, sort of a prototype of this world that, uh, we, Ilya and I have been talking about, um, worked on IBC, worked on a lot of different bridging protocols. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm excited to be, uh, talking to the near community about, where I think um, like a whole, what I think is gonna be like the next big uh, sort of industry-wide uh, sort of meta narrative um, uh, coming after sort of the the fast monolithic blockchains and the uh, like sort of modular explosion. Awesome, well, thanks for coming, Amelia. I think uh, you need to disable your sound. Okay, hold on, probably. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Ilya, I'm co-founder of NIR, and uh, yeah, we've kind of from the beginning been really focused on how do we really make it easy for people to use blockchain. Um, kind of the strong belief is that as a user, I want to get value i want to have an a uh, you know all the economic opportunity that blockchain provides sovereignty security but at the same time i you know don't really care about the specific infrastructure decisions um that uh, different chains are taking you know different wallets as well as uh kind of the complexity that you know a lot of blockchains have introduced and so for us, we've really kind of from the start tried to abstract blockchain as much as possible, um, kind of hide complexity, as well as uh, as we've been thinking about how does kind of this multi-chain world looks like, uh, it pretty naturally meant that, you know, we can continue expanding our kind of offering to multi-chain world while still preserving the simplicity that we've been trying to introduce. And so actually we had a uh, podcast with Zaki in 2020 that I just re-listened today um, where we were, we, it was a debate format of if, if there are going to be only a few chains or lots of chains. And uh, I, I mean, there was a lot of interesting uh, aspects there, but obviously we, we see a world with a lot of chains um, but to me, the kind of enabler enabling factor has been the ZK that kind of enables, uh, really unified security, uh, for chains. And so you don't need to spin up like a new validator that is set new blockchain to get your own kind of environment. And I think maybe we can start there because I mean, there's a lot of pieces of kind of this chain abstraction, uh, that coming together. But I'm actually curious, yeah, how, how you think about it, given kind of Cosmos started in a very different place, right? Of like, okay, well, everybody should start their own uh, chain with their own validator set. And then, you know, you kind of also started exploring some of the security unification. Um, yeah, so I'm curious how you think about this, Zaki. Well, I think I think it's been clear to me, at least, uh, that the end state... You muted uh, on Spaces. Too many devices. Uh, okay, so it's been clear to me from the beginning that the or okay, so I remember um, like very very early on in my uh, sort of blockchain journey, um, uh, Aaron and Ellie came uh, and presented at my tiny little meetup um, in uh, Mountain View uh, the zero cash paper, um, which eventually became uh, the basis for Zcash. Um, and it was like the first public presentation uh, outside of like MIT and um, 
uh, Israel about uh, uh, outside of MIT and Technion of uh, like snarks. Um, and it was like, okay, this is like complete magic and witchcraft. Like, how is it this possible that like you can get these like succinct proofs of arbitrary execution? So then it was like, okay, how long will it take before you can have these succinct proof proofs? So, you know, at that point, you know, this is like 2013. Uh, you know, Z zero knowledge was like almost was, you know, it started in the 80s and it it took 30 years to get from um from like the I from like the original like PCP theorem papers to like uh zero to like the zero cash paper. And we're like, okay, another 30 years to get to like uh uh you know fully programmable, succinctly verifiable um proof carrying data systems like what we like. Okay, and that was the expectation. Um, and then Zcash launched, and then it Zcash launched in you know twenty fifteen, and it unleashed this giant torrent of innovation. Uh, and here we are, like it seemed like we have like expressive proof systems, expressive languages. Uh, provers are getting more efficient all the time, and like zk just completely reframes the world of. And so, I do think of like the Cosmos design as you know, doing the best you could um, with satisfying people's desires for sovereignty and interoperability um, uh, with a technology of like uh, consensus protocols and consensus protocols with effective light clients. Um, and you still, there, uh, uh, you know, there are, there are still use cases for consensus protocols and committees aren't going away. Um, but the security properties of the system and like what your committee is guaranteeing you go down dramatically when you add proofs on top of it. So like the future of interop is like a system that like direct, like deeply relies on uh, zero knowledge. Um, and in general, that's like the end state of blockchains in general. It's the most secure censorship resistant system is a system where like, you know, like if you want to have a system of financial markets and there's a financial market that can be spun up basically on any computer anywhere in the world, but provide really like strong guarantees against corruptibility um, and can interoperate with any other market anywhere in the world, you've basically created like this like kind of extremely censorship resistant, extremely uh, like, you know, cockroach like unkillable financial system. Uh, so I think that's like, you know, that system essentially, like the prototype of that system now exists today. Um, a lot of people have done a lot of work to make that system possible. Uh, and I think once you have imagined the base layer of that system, which is like, there's some interoperability protocol, there's some proving, proof system, uh, like there are some languages for building for building like economic primitives. Like we've kind of, we're like, we've, we, we've been speed running to the end state uh, of that. And now it's a question of what comes later. Yeah, exactly. I think that this was very interesting to see kind of last year, right? As we had modularity really taking shape, kind of seeing a lot of folks kind of experimenting. So there's a really, you know, somewhat a snarky uh, tweet from uh, Mert about, you know, like if you, if you list all the possible options of all the, you know, execution DA kind of sequencer, VMs, et cetera, uh, you get like, you know, a thousand different rollups uh, and probably like, there's probably some combination of things that would be more preferred, but even on top of it, right, there's uh, with rollups in the service, you can spin up a, a, another 10,000 of these. Um, and so we have this kind of highly modular, highly fragmented world. And we obviously still have a ton of blockchains, you know, layer ones, um, app chains uh, in Cosmos. And so, so now the question is, okay, now what, right? Now there's like this vast uh, amount of block space, you know, these blocks are being produced everywhere at all the time. And uh, as a user now, you know, I have like, I have one MetaMask that has so many networks in it that you need to scroll. Um, I have a lot of different windows with different wallets uh, uh, in different browsers. And so, so we have this, highly fragmented environment. And then on the other side, as a user, uh, sorry, as a developer, 
when you're building your app, you're only targeting whatever's audience is on that chain, right? You have a very limited kind of addressable market. Uh, and so now you are pretty much looking for additional help from the chain itself to grow it, uh, addressable market, kind of its own user base to even be able to interact with them. And so, so this kind of what, uh, you know, something that like from our side near, near is designed in, internally as a lot of chains, right? But we abstract this out. We don't like use, you as a user don't need to think that like every account is actually a separate chain. Like you just, you know, transact and all the cross chain interactions kind of hidden uh, to use just an account of the system. And so the question is like, can we get to a level of similar experience across a vast uh, multi-chain environment uh, and like what are the pieces that are needed to really pull it all together? So one thing that I think is the case with Near and other blockchains that I think are going to be doing this chain abstraction thing like Agoric and Enoma, et cetera, is that like these things were like designed correctly from like like with like a correct set of abstractions, like from the get go, it's that, um, you know, like the current, like the current theory of how everything goes to market right now is like you, uh, 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 like you launch your new thing, whether it's a uh, 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 monolithic L1, L2, Cosmos chain, whatever, um, you set off a speculative frenzy of <laughs> of like new asset issuance and meme coins uh, and NFTs. Um, you have some set of economic primitives for like trading and exchanging those things that onboards users. And then like you achieve some critical mass under which, you know, there's like a sufficient total addressable market in terms of both TBL and users that like your uh, uh, system. But like, if there are, thousands of possibilities of of uh of uh, uh thousands of possibilities of like chain da execution environment etc like this pattern cannot repeat itself forever um and this is like not this this is not how i think so like these like systems that i think may not have been like are not re like systems that like have been built with this like vision of okay like Every account is its own little like asynchronous locality of state that can like reach out um, across a multi-chain environment from your account um, uh, that's hosted somewhere, like create effects across multiple blockchains. Like these things are like properly designed um, and they're properly designed for that world that comes after like this sort of repeated pattern of like speculation, TBL, accumulation, like trying to break through. One of the other problems, right, is that like, that I've always, that was like a real challenge for for crypto is that like people who respond like very positively to like number go up, yield, like uh, like this thing will go to zero, a thousand X, like playing PVP games in like liquidity pools. Like this is a relatively small population in the world's consumer base. Um, right. Like this isn't, this is not the user base of Facebook or Instagram or Gmail. Like, yes, there is demand for like payments is a widely demanded thing. Identity is a long way like, like, loyalty programs are widely demand things. Like, so there are lots of things that we do in, in crypto that are like have very large TBLs, but if our bootstrapping is like attract roughly the same population of like, um, volatility, attracted people like there's this continuous gap that we're trying to like bridge across um uh and where you're and the one where you're trying to leap from okay i've attracted all like if let's say you've succeeded you've attracted all of these like people who are attracted to volatility to your chain cool now how do i get them to do things other than just speculate on mean calls yeah i think that that's a valid point that I mean, th there is kind of different sub audiences that we have and the sub audience of kind of speculators, right, is very important for crypto, but at the same time, it, it doesn't provide a very clear path from 
kind of how to how to bridge the gap right uh to a kind of more early majority that's actually going to be using this kind of not for speculation but for their day-to-day -day use cases so what we've seen on near right and we have we actually just recorded i think all-time high of you of uh daily active accounts uh was over 1.8 million um is that if you remove the need for the users to know about the blockchain, right? If the application um, is designed in such a way that it's extremely straightforward, right? You can get to kind of almost educate the users on what a different benefits are as you're kind of introducing more and more features to them in a way that, you know, is interesting and, and engaging for them, right? So we have Sweatcoin and Cosmos, which are have completely hidden blockchain from their users, right? I think like there is a way to find that you have an address and and you can like even find how to bridge tokens to other chains and stuff, but it's not like in your face, right? You just have an app, you're interacting with it uh, and kind of all the interactions are uh, within that app. And that's kind of the inspiration in many ways, right? It's like, how do we get that experience, but really working across uh, all of the blockchains uh, and in a way transparently uh, kind of remove, you know, need to know about transaction fees, about, you know, specific gas tokens, bridging, kind of all of the species of experience that are really just an implementation detail of kind of our specific, you know, um, approach to, to, you know, securing and transacting on blockchains. So I know, I mean, Cosmos has been working on a lot of the pieces for a while. Uh, we've started also kind of over a year now building out some of the pieces of the stack. So I think the biggest kind of enabler for this is what we call account aggregation and you guys have as interchain accounts is this ability for a single account to really transact across many chains. So I'm curious, yeah, maybe if you can expand like uh, on the history of interchain accounts, as well as how you see this evolving kind of from different directions. Yeah. Okay. So, um, initially IBC want, so the, the history of IBC was initially like what was proposed in the white paper was we would launch a token transfer protocol and then build a generalized system. Um, what ended up actually happening is we built a generalized system and then layered a token transfer protocol uh, on top of it. Um, the token transfer protocol was successful um, as, uh, as a system of, um, uh, the token transfer protocol was extremely successful um, as like for building like basically DEXs on top of it. Um, like token swaps, all the stuff, uh, osmosis, you know, um, the token transfer protocol on IBC does billions of dollars of volume a month. Um, it's like one of the one of the bridge, biggest uh, uh, bridging and interoperability protocols. Um, but then we came up, you know, but like shortly after there was this idea of what if we made it so that um, uh, so standard user accounts or something that looks a lot like a standard user account on a Cosmos chain um, could be controlled. So basically any transaction that could be sent by that user account could it send be passed over IBC. And I want to say like interchain accounts, like the initial version of it shipped probably in 2022. It's like been live for a long, long time. Um, and the primary adoption of interchain accounts initially was it turned out that all like basically um liquid staking protocols in Cosmos decided to build on top of interchain accounts. So the basic idea is, is you launch a blockchain and that blockchain uh, uh, would have, that blockchain has, you launch a blockchain, that blockchain has, uh, has uh, takes like atoms, it's, it opens an interchain account, it stakes those atoms, earning staking rewards and like, uh, 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 and then like compounding those staking rewards. And then it gives you a fungible token that can, is like redeemable for that. And 
um, you know, a lot of other parts, uh, and it wasn't like entirely obvious that this would become dominant, but like the dominant liquid staking protocols now in, in Cosmos um, all use this interchain account system. But interchain accounts can be used for a lot more. Um, you could have uh, uh, like on-chain governance or DAOs could control accounts um, on other chains uh, and that kind of stuff. But like user, like UI, UX. So like, I think we're like, you know, we're probably about two years into like the interchain accounts protocol. And there's finally a UI for like a DAO on one chain in Cosmos to control an account on another uh, chain in Cosmos, um, which, you know, is a is to a certain extent a result of the chaotic nature of Cosmos. It's also an extent to which all of these things take a long time and are early. Um, but, and then like another uh, uh, sort of related system that like is sort of in the like wider Cosmos ecosystem is ThorChain. And the way ThorChain works is really, is also very interesting in the sense of there are like ThorChain does not use, is built on as a Cosmos chain, but it, and it's in a multi-chain DEX, but it doesn't have IBC. Uh, instead, what it has is escrow accounts um, on all of the different chains it supports, um, most notably Bitcoin. And then so like if you want to do a swap, um, you you send your funds to the S2 escrow accounts um, controlled by the validator set of both chains. Those validator sets then uh, like see that the, all the funds have been received and then like execute the other side of the swap. Um, so like you could send Bitcoin to an escrow account. That escrow account then set and you say, I want to buy Tether. Um, then you know, Tether on let's say Ethereum or Tron um gets sent to an escrow account. Um, and then the chain sees that those things are it has custody of both funds, and then sends the Bitcoin to whoever's supposed to receive it and the tether to whoever's supposed to receive it. Uh so like we have these like early chain abstracted apps. Um, and we could talk more about how sommelier is also in this pattern, but I think those are really good examples of like things that are practically doing like uh, Thorchain is doing like 1% of Bitcoin spot volume roughly right now, which is just huge. Um, and, uh, you know, interchain accounts for liquid staking on Cosmos um, do are custodying hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars. So these are all big successes for these systems. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I think this is really kind of, paved the way to show how this work. I think for me, one, one of the important things have always been that the bridges on themselves are um, sadly a the, the, the least robust part of the blockchains, right? Because they kind of, they try to unite security of two sides. And, and you know, as we talked in the beginning, the security part is getting, um, you know, in some way more unified but still kind of they require a lot of maintenance. They require kind of synchronization. And so I think one of the things that we are pushing is what we call unbridging. And so in, in, in a similar way that ThorChain, for example, uh, the chain itself has accounts on, on, uh, on different other chains, is this ability to have kind of for any account on near to have kind of remote accounts everywhere else and being able to transact with them without needing to bridge. And so kind of as part of this, I wanted to uh, invite Kendall to kind of who works a lot uh, more closely with all this uh, to kind of speak about some of the use cases that uh, uh, he sees as well as like people already building out. Um, yeah, so anyway, I see it. There's like two kind of different audiences here that are like kind of appeal, can, can eventually be appealed to by whether it's interchain accounts or like kind of the near multi-chain accounts. There's the, the crypto native audience who is very different in that a lot of times they, they actually really care or want to know about what chain they're on. And then you have like normal people or institutions or whatever it might be more like the normies who actually are just trying to solve some kind of problem or like actually want, you know, as much of what chain they're on or, or where their assets are, whatever it is to be abstracted away as possible. Um, 
I think the yeah the the for the crypto native audience the the areas are really excited about are basically just there's like a, a couple of important things to basically abstract away. You know, one is, or, or at least like simplify. One is just getting your assets between chains. And in the Cosmos world, IBC does a really great job of that. Um, but in the non-Cosmos world, which is a lot of, you know, a lot of chains that people want to interact with, the solutions are are pretty messy. Like at the very least, you have to kind of navigate the world of bridge trade-offs. And while there's plenty of great teams there, like that is complicated. And then even if you find a bridge to get your assets across, you have to kind of fix figure out how you're going to pay for gas. And I think there's a lot of teams trying to solve that problem, but it's still quite messy. Um, and then the other problem you'll have is that like almost zero bridges go everywhere, right? Um, because it's obviously quite complex to even add, you know, any sort of new chain to this sort of mix outside of the IBC world. Um, and so I think that there's some, yeah, the Thor chain, I think actually has done a really good job of at least showing uh, the potential for, you know, using threshold signing for these, you um, for these uh, kind of deposit accounts. Um, but what we're excited about doing is expanding that even further to like the user account level. Um, and I think that opens up a lot of opportunities, both on the normie side, where like you actually now can have an account that can sign for any chain, like any chain that's elliptic curve is supported, which, you know, can, is actually fairly straightforward, at least to, to add over time, um, you can sign for. Uh, and then what gets really interesting is you can also like make these accounts smart contracts that are immutable, and then you can build protocols on top of it. So you can then have protocols that can actually control assets um, on various different chains. Now, where things get complicated is, uh, you know, ThorChain, obviously, to add support for these new chains, they basically need their validators to run full nodes, uh, which does create some kind of scaling challenges there, or at least like some, you know, it, it, there's a lot of implementation work to add new support for new chains. Uh, so we're actually pretty excited about the potential to build protocols, accepting the design constraint of the fact that you that the near chain in this case would have no idea of like essentially which account, like with the value of the accounts that it's signing for. Um, but there's some interesting ways to still kind of design some cross-chain swaps with this or even lending protocols with this. Um, or, you know, even I think, you know, another great design space is kind of bringing smart contract functionality to chains that don't have it, whether that's Bitcoin um, or, you know, even Atom. I think it's been really cool to see the uh, inscriptions protocol that's taken off on Atom. Obviously, a lot of great ways to use IBC there, but I think... Uh, there's some fun stuff that we'll be exploring building there too, to just like bring programmability to these kind of chains that don't have a smart contract layer built in. Yeah, I think one of the really interesting examples uh, is kind of using the NEARS um, kind of account abstraction, native account abstraction that we have is because if you have this uh, kind of addresses linked to your account, and let's say you have, you know, some Bitcoins, some ordinals, some atoms, some, you know, MATLAB NFT, you kind of all link to one near account. You can actually sell like that near account, turn it into NFT and list it on the marketplace and do all that at kind of a speed of near in, you know, atomic uh, or semi-atomic approach without needing to kind of transact across all of the blockchains involved in this transition. So I think this is one of the kind of those interesting cases where by abstracting this out, right, you're actually kind of creating this new level at which people can transact without needing to think about individual um, kind of assets and chains and uh, transacting there. And in turn, this allows to have kind of this new level of programmability as well uh, for developers. So maybe kind of uh, switching gears, the, I mean, there's like a, you know, use case where as, you know, some of these apps like uh, Cosmos, you know, getting hundreds of millions of users, they transact across all of this. I think question is like, how do we bring the kind of most developers to this concept? Like, how do we educate them that this is really important versus kind of the current approach where people pick one chain and, and kind of focus on it. And I know Zach, you have been kind of talking about some of this before. Um, so curious uh, kind of to voice your opinion. So I guess the question in my mind is really whether or not any of these, like, I think like one of the bigger points is that like very few applications that represent like a full end-to-end -end 
user workflow exists today and in the modern world no application that like does a full end-to-end -end user workflow is going to be like truly single chain um there are like i think like but like I think the idea is, but like the other side of that is, is that these tribes are never going to go away. There's going to be like, there's going to be an Adam tribe. There's going to be a soul tribe. There's going to be a near tribe. There's going to be an ETH tribe. There's going to be a Bitcoin tribe. Um, there's, it's on like, I don't think the like social layer of these things just dissolves. Um, and so I think like what you are going to see is like more like apps that are located firmly within their tribes. Um, and like appeal to people within their tribes, but like are at the same time willing to um are gonna be are, are gonna need tools and abstractions to like appeal to like the like all all users who are willing to be onboarded and onboarded. So maybe to to kind of frame this a little bit more controversially, the current dApps are not actual dApps. They're just front ends for smart contracts on some chains. And yeah. And, like and if you smart contracts are not apps. Smart, smart contracts, contracts are not apps. Yeah, they're just pieces of logic and functionality and state. Yeah. Like, I think our question is like, like to, or like to be more concretely, is uh, like Uniswap or uh, or Oasis on Solana uh, uh, or even like Osmosis, are they apps? Or are they just front ends to uh uh like a swap functionality which is a a useful piece of tech but like you a know, feature not, of financial app. yeah it's it's a finance feature like nobody yeah. thinks you know like the market is somewhat like uh if, if you look at like trad fi and like what you're like on what like a, a brokerage account uh provides you um uh and like, which is like multiple ways, like you don't think of the stock exchange as the app. No, it's like, well, I want to like, uh, I want exposure to this assets. I want to like manage your portfolio, like portfolio management is the app. Uh, uh, not, uh, not like I happen to swap at like this particular venue. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this, there's been the flip side of composability is that like you can build and composability and like this access, you can build a feature, a very powerful feature and make it really big, right? Because everything else around you composes. Uh, and so, you know, Uniswap obviously built on top of the fact that there is MetaMask and there is kind of other, uh, you know, forces that onboard users and assets have been launched uh, without needing to do all that. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I think as as we need as we need to transition to this uh, kind of next stage of growth, we really need to kind of acknowledge mm -hmm. that the best products will, you know, encompass the whole user journey. They will provide a really easy way to, you know, start using, start earning, start transacting, and kind of. Uh, but like it will be all packaged in one. And then from there, like they probably want to, like that app will want to have access to the whole multi-chain world of, of kind of logic and liquidity and uh, kind of bits and pieces that exist in Web3 to really provide the best experience to their users. And I think that's really what at the core of chain abstraction that uh, we're kind of talking about here is that um, like this new generation of apps that will be kind of built in, in this mindset will will be the ones targeting kind of broader set beyond just, you know, any single tribe. And in but in turn they will be able to, you know, provide value and and uh to all of the chains as well and kind of in a way arbitrage whatever the best smart contract and whatever the best kind of liquidity attractor is. I don't know, Kendall, if you want to add something. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, if, if we look at a lot of what exists in crypto today, you know, especially at least on the DeFi side, like it's it's infrastructure, right? It's like yeah, the primitives are basically financial infrastructure. And so like what matters is that that infrastructure is used to like proliferate new new assets or or make, you know, existing assets like just 
you know, the experience around existing assets and the financialization of them, you know, more efficient in some way. So I definitely agree that like, you know, the, the apps, the fully featured apps are kind of yet to come. I think what gets really interesting and, and where chain abstraction becomes kind of more paramount is like, you know, there's a lot of different design choices that are and trade-offs that are being made in, you know, creating each of these different chains, whether it's app chain or, you know, kind of like a, you know, a, a general chain. Um, and so you would expect that like, we're going to see different applications that are going to like make more sense on different chains. And in that world, you're going to need like that's where that's the world in which you expect that these kind of full feature applications may actually be taking advantage of different components that are proliferating on different chains because those technical trade-offs are more likely to favor them. Um, and so I, I think that like, yeah, it, it seems like that's the way that we're going. I mean, it's, it's early in the sense that I think there's right now, like Zach, you pointed out earlier, there's uh, basically like the same set of primitives that each new chain or even L2 now, or eventually L3 is just redeploying under maybe different brand names or even the same brand names and just kind of like, you know, splintering off basically, uh, like more like copy paste. And then maybe you get to the point of innovation. Um, so I think we'll see that hopefully start to kind of erode as it'll be like, oh, actually, you know, this chain or layer two, whatever it is, makes more sense for this type of use case. This one makes more sense for this one. And then we can have enough of this kind of like infrastructure built on top of it that hopefully, you know, whether it's IBC or NARA or a combination of that can be used to actually build these, these full experiences that people actually desire to use rather than just like infrastructure for them that, you know, appeal to sp a specific tribal norm. And obviously tribalism is not going to go away. That probably is one of the core products of crypto, <laughs> digital tribalism, at least. Uh, so certainly that needs to be catered, like those users need to be catered to as well. But yeah, I think we're going to see uh, a lot more of like the building on top and the abstraction as we onboard more and more people to this to this kind of world. Awesome. Uh, should we have open it up for questions or I don't know, Zaki, if you have anything else to add. Um, I, I think that this question, right, is it's like, so I will just say like one of the experiences with building Sommelier, which is like this, like has, it has components on Ethereum, it has components on ethel 2 it has components on a Cosmos chain. It presents to its users exactly as if it was an Ethereum app. Um, which is, was like, Christine, Christie's like, Christine, my vision of like, do not ship this as a Cosmos chain. There's, um, and so, you know, the tribe that you build for and the TAM that you go after are not inherently related to the technology you use. Um, and I think that's going to be like that. So, you know, you're going to start seeing things that get positioned uh, at like, you could imagine a world in which you see something that is like fully positioned as like the best bonk trading experience, but it uses a bunch of near accounts uh, under the hood and a bunch of places to like enable people to like onboard and offboard off of Solana for their telegram bots to like for the telecom trading bots to have like smart, like intelligent account permissioning, et cetera. Which is with it without having to say, oh, okay, like what, like what can we cram? Can we cram the optimal solution to every design problem into like the SVM design patterns? Which like there's just there are inherent trade offs. Yeah, I mean to show we have a Telegram trading bot coming out, uh, leveraging account abstraction. So uh, sounds like that's their next use case uh, to offer bonk. But yeah, I think the Maybe one one thing that like for me that I always find challenging that people perceived like you know th there is the kind of a perception among and especially it's VCs but but it it kind of goes beyond that a chain specific metrics like uh, TVL or other things affect like the success of the app building there because the perception is that you're limited by the users and kind of you know liquidity that is available there and i think what what we're talking here importantly kind of breaks through that and in a way invalidates a lot of the things that people are looking at right now and instead really kind of brings it back to like what is the best use case what's uh what's the best uh kind of you know programmatically like you know if you think of databases you don't think of like oh uh 
the this database is like I'm gonna cram everything into it, right? It's like oh, I'm gonna use MongoDB for this and you know Postgres for this, uh, and like Cassandra for that, and so uh, so I, I would say like we'll see some of, some of that transition as well in the space, which I'm I'm just generally excited about. <laughs> um, so I think like one of the things just to like reinforce this idea is I think I don't think a lot of investors in the space under like have a detailed understanding of why things like TVL sort of restrict restrict your ability. And it has a lot more to do with like custody onboarding, like custody risk management, um, that kind of stuff. And like how a lot of actors in the space like think about those things. Um, and so there's like a lot of different counterparties that are like onboarded onto Ethereum. Um, and it was relatively, it's like, it's been an easier story to say, oh, you as a counterparty are onboarded in Ethereum. How do we onboard you onto an L2? Um, than it is to like go to that same set of counterparties and onboard them onto Celestia um, or onboard them onto uh, Solana or onboard them onto, um, but the, uh, but I do think what we are sketching out as a world is a world that if you think of counterparties onboarding onto these like sort of uh, account like or chain abstracted like interfaces and chain abstracted uh, systems and layers, then they're like, okay, cool. I and we've we've we we have both we've uh, we've seen some of this in Cosmos and we're seeing and I would say. Uh, We've tried at various points in the past to push it harder, and maybe that th those moments are coming closer. Like, so what we've seen is is that like if you onboard onto like one Cosmos chain, even if the Cosmos chains are very very different from each other, it is easier to see at, to, for like counterparties who have figured out custody compliance everything for one Cosmos chain to then do another Cosmos chain. One of the things that we pitched in the past to things like custodians is like, hey, like what if there was one Cosmos chain where you would control, where like where you would hold all of your assets, could you simplify your onboarding? So like rather than every individual Cosmos chain having to go to the same list of custodians and the same list of exchanges and get onboarded, can we just have a solution? And I, you know, there's some things I can't talk about yet, but there are some like big players in the ecos in like the crypto ecosystem that are ready to like kind of dip their toes into this a little bit where they're like, okay, like we haven't onboarded uh, this chain, but we have onboarded a chain that uh, like IBC is embedded in. And like, we are comfortable you starting to use some IBC features so that users on our platform um, can like, for instance, like, uh, you know, send assets to Osmosis if we haven't on, on, onboarded Osmosis or, uh, you know, uh, or like Liquid Stake Atom or something like that using our interfaces without having to like directly. And I think a lot more of this, and like some of this can be done permissionlessly in Cosmos. Like you could, like you could create a, a an account on let's say Noble and say uh, like a, another smart contract platform or an MPC platform or something could like say, if you like, we'll create an account and a user just needs to put that account into their Coinbase, send USDC to that account. And then it will do some complicated thing, like swap into Atom, liquid stake that Atom, and then like, uh, uh, you know, like leverage stake it. Um, that complicated thing could be embedded and encoded as a user interface element as just like, here's this one noble address, stick it into Coinbase. Yeah, and I think this is, Kind of the direction we as near trying to build toward where ideally anyone just needs to integrate one time and then has access to kind of all the chains you know from bitcoin to all the evms to solana to cosmos chains and i think uh on the on our side we're also trying to make it easier to integrate by actually adding ethereum transaction format and kind of standards uh, to really make it kind of straightforward for a lot of the counterparty to do this. So I think the there's definitely like this kind of removing the barrier to onboard and then also removing the barrier to interact kind of across the vast majority of the chains 
it also has this like interesting equalizer effect where right now, you know, if you have like a roll up or a chain and you, you know, you figured out how to do partnership with, you know, this custodian or that uh, partner who like added whatever, some other support, like this approach of, you know, account aggregation will actually kind of equalize it because, you know, you can just deposit assets, you can uh, kind of swap, et cetera, with any chain directly. You don't need uh, to uh, have them onboarded. You can even, for example, take the Oracle information, repost it on every other chain uh, in the same way. Right. And so you have kind of the same level of security that Neo provides. So you can have like all this interesting like replication waves going kind of through the whole other blockchains as well.